Well, hey, good evening, everybody. Well, Pastor Gil here's uh, at home now over the Thanksgiving weekend and uh, just going through some messages and stuff. And one message I was typing out, uh, I had it all done, but the uh, computer decided to go ahead and shut down on me and not start back up again. So anyways, I'm here in the bedroom now, not in my office broadcasting this message uh, using a good old tablet. Anyhow, so I was going through some messages online and stuff, uh, going through some chat rooms, and a lot of the messages that I see out there are misconceptions here. Uh, people who uh, have a lot of misinformation out there, uh, a lot of thought provocative ideals of what uh, the resurrection's like, what salvation's like, the Lamb's Book of Life, and uh, grace. For one, uh, I just as a minister, I'm, I'm just like, wow, really? People think that this way of grace, you know, they don't see the full message that grace is. So, anyways, I got a Bible guide here, kind of going through some stuff here. We're gonna start in Revelations 20, where uh, Armageddon has just been done uh, on Earth. Jesus has vanquished the uh, Antichrist, and now we have the judgment where. The devil is being cast into the lake of fire. And what will happen in Revelations 20, to, to kind of give you a synopsis, those who are the unbelievers in Christ are going to be raised up for a second re resurrection. Okay? And the books of life are going to be opened up then. Okay? Those who are unbelieving in Jesus will be ones who will be judged whether their books are in, in the book or not. And you'll be judged upon your deeds you did here on earth, your works and stuff. Those are the people that will be judged by the great white throne. Not by the ones who uh, believed in Jesus and had faith and asked for Jesus, you know, for salvation in his, in his name. Okay. The church isn't in present yet at this point. Uh, that happens in chapter 21, where the church comes as a bride adorned in all white to be joined in with Jesus as one. Uh, that's when the uh, new heaven comes down to the new earth. The new earth is gone. It's vanquished. It's away. We have everything that's new now. And so the new heaven comes down as the new Jerusalem. Now, the church is the new Jerusalem. Okay, I need to make that point clear. Uh, it says that John says that in chapter 21, that the church basically is the new Jerusalem. Okay, uh, so you're you're if you're in Jesus and you're a believer of Jesus and you follow his teachings and stuff, you tried your best to abide by him and not sin and stuff. I know there's a lot of verses out there and stuff and people go on and say, well, you need to repent. Okay, repent is uh, in the Greek repentai, which means to change your mind and change your way. Okay, so you need to change your mindset on what sin is. And that's how you repent. Okay, you're changing your mindset of it, basically. So if I was to go out, let's say, and cuss at someone or holler at someone and stuff and be really mean and crass towards them and just downright self-centered. Well, to me, I just sinned, you know. Uh, that's how I take it, is I sinned because I wasn't kind, like it said in John, to be kind to your brother and stuff. So to repent of that sin, I would have to change my mindset. And when I go out to see that same person the next day, I'm kind to them. I apologize for my behavior and I change my attitude towards that person. OK, that's what repent means, basically, in short synopsis there. So anyways, I was lucky enough to get some notes printed out here. Um, those who believe in Christ, you know, as your personal savior, turning from sin and living a godly life as Christ has shown us, we will pass by the great white throne judgment. Okay. Seeing God's grace and all its glory and revealed. Paul mentions this in Ephesians 8 through 9 in chapter 2. By grace, you have been saved through faith. This is not of your doing, but a gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. Uh, I really like what Paul has to say there, you know. It's because of Jesus dying on the cross for us that we are saved, okay. Uh, give you a little bit of a history lesson here. 
before Jesus died on the cross, the Jewish people, Hebrews at that period in time, there was one day, it's called a day of atonement, and that's when you brought a sacrifice to the temple to uh, be, have your sins covered, okay? To have them covered. What, not taken away, but covered, okay? Now, that was before the cross. Now we are after the cross, okay? When Jesus died and had said, it is finished, he sat down at the Father's right throne, which means it's finished, it's done, Okay? That means Jesus took away the sin. Okay, it mentions this in Mark and it mentions it in Matthew. I think it says it in uh, Corinthians and in Acts. Who also you can find it where Jesus took away sin. Okay, John the Baptizer says that, Behold, look who comes, the man who takes away all sin of the world. So the sin gets taken away, basically. Uh, he won't remember your sin anymore, Jesus doesn't, when you uh, are in him. Uh, and as far as from the uh, sun from the east to the west, you know, the sin isn't remembered anymore whatsoever. Uh, gosh, <laughs> I'm just so filled here with the Holy Ghost and uh, got all these things that I want to say and get this message out to you guys. So give me some time here. Uh, just thankfully that, you know, we're, we're, we are saved. This is the theme of the whole entire Bible. We are saved not by anything what we do, but by God's goodness, okay? It's a free gift of internal life. Uh, grace, basically, tomorrow is tomorrow's sin, already forgiven in short. Uh, when Jesus was on the cross and hanging there, he was taking the sin of the whole world, not only of your past sin and your present sin, but sin that you're going to commit. Because he, as God, knew what you were already going to be doing. He knew your steps. So he knew that when he went to the cross, that what was you were going to do, okay? So we should be thankful every day from the time we rise up out of bed. We should be giving thanks to the Lord for what he's done for us and stuff. Not just, you know, here and there or Sunday morning or stuff like that. It should be an everyday thing. And it should be an evening thing, too, before you go to sleep. That you should be thankful to the Lord. Okay. So... In Romans 5, chapter 5, 1 through 2, uh, basically, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with the God through the Lord Jesus Christ, and through him we obtain access by faith into grace, which we stand and we rejoice in hope of glory of God. So, uh, yeah, it's grace that saves you, not yourself. Uh, those who turn their hearts from God are the ones that are going to be judged by their works here. And uh, I'm going to get to that point here real soon. So it's because of grace that Jesus did not treat us as our sins deserve us. Uh, you know, if it wasn't for Jesus, we all be bound for hell, basically. Okay, so in Micah, you know, in Psalms 1-3, it says from the east to the west and stuff like that. And again in Micah, Chapter 7, 13, he will again compassion on us and he will tread our inequities underfoot. You will cast all of your sins into the depth of the sea. Okay, so now we got to the points of what ifs. And this comes up in the minds and people who read the scriptures and stuff or who hear things, little snippets here and there. So one of them is, well, can I lose my salvation? Now, we could say this full proof text against it, and we could say there's full proof test for it. But I'm going to go into what the doctrine says, because uh, the gospel is the truth. It is what we base ourselves on, okay? Uh, basically, the gospel, if it's from God, it's going to edify you and exalt you. And lifts you up. If it doesn't do those three things, then it's not from the gospel. It's the words of the devil. The devil, he likes to take this message and cloud it in your head and twist it and everything like that. And, you know, we got to be able to keep our mindset there because the, no one knows the book better than the devil. Okay. Lucifer knows the Bible. He, he likes to use those words and twist them and omit things and stuff like that. 
So you have to, you know, be able to read your Bible and know those, know the gospel. Okay. So uh, perseverance of the internal security, but let's assume that when in Revelations chapter three five says that God will erase your name from the book of life. Okay. And I've gotten this a lot in some chat rooms that I'm in and stuff about, well, can I be erased from the book of life? Can it be blotted out and stuff like that? So I'm going to get into that here. Alrighty. So it basically implies that does, erase, does God erase the people from the book of life? Now, Paul writes this here. And that Paul, uh, John writes this here in Revelations because in that period of time, where John was at in uh, that time of Israel, cities would keep a register of citizens living within that town. And if you died or had moved off or was kicked out of town because of leprosy or some other disease, your name on that register was blotted out. You weren't looked upon as a citizen of that town. Okay, so that kind of gives you a little bit of history of why we have this here verse here in three five okay the justified nevertheless to say uh, the condemned and lost perish in other words they lose their salvation on reading on that verse of revelations 3 5 but is it a true assumption well i'd like to refer back to revelations 21 19 and elaborate on certain facts of that verse this scripture is not written for fake believers or unbelievers but it's written for true christians okay whose name was written in the book of life now, how do we know that? Because they are already in that book and they will lose the privilege if they commit serious crime of adding or taking away from it, which means if you add or take away from the Bible. OK, uh, that's why a lot of people are so upset about, you know, translation of the Bible. Uh, this translation is the true translation and we should learn from this translation only and not this one here. Because it loses its translation. So it might have some words omitted from it and took it out or some other words added to it. Well, I have a bunch of different translations of the Bible. I have it in Hebrew. I have it in Greek. I have it in King James Version. I have it in NIV. And I have it in American Standard and stuff. And uh, my always belief has always been that if it, it's the holy book, you know, and it's going to move you closer to God. I don't care what translation it is. You know, as long as you're picking up and reading it, that's to me is better than not reading it and having to become a dust cover or weight paperweight or something. You know, uh, the book was meant to be read to read and to uh, lift us up and guide our day and stuff like that. All right. Nevertheless, condemned. OK, in other words, you know, but is this a true assumption? OK, so where was I at here? All right. Because that already the book will lose the privilege of serious crime. What if it boldly declares that if you commit that crime, you, you will lose the destiny you once had? Is it the same idea of being blotted out the book of life, which is in Revelations 3, 5? Okay, unlike popular documents such as the unconditional security and the truth of people, being blotted out remain. Judas Iscariot was written in the book of life, but by transgressions, he lost his place in that book. So what does that say? That yes, you can be blotted out uh, if you commit some serious crimes against God. So in Matthew 19, 28, Jesus addressing the 12 apostles declares to them that which included Judas, that they would be judged, judging the 12 tribes and the new Jerusalem and sitting on 12 thrones. And Jesus had left all to follow. But Jesus had all the same privileges of calling but Judas. <laughs> He lost that position when and bought it out in the book of life. So what did Jesus do? Judas do? He betrayed Jesus. He was filled with the devil, basically, and turned from him. He turned his heart from him. Okay. When you turn your heart away from the Holy Ghost and Jesus, that is a serious crime. That is a, 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 a crime of blasphemy, basically. And it's an unforgivable sin to do that. You cannot be forgiven for it, no matter how much you're sorry for it. There's a lot of sin that can be forgiven, for God's sakes. Murder is one of them. You know, we, we think of, it, oh my God, it's in the Ten Commandments. You know, if it's you go against the Ten Commandments, then you've committed sin and stuff against God. But, you know, murder can be forgiven in God's eyes. Being 
turn from the Holy Ghost and Jesus, turning your hearts against them, is one that doesn't doesn't get forgiven. Okay, so uh, it commits on the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost and stuff. The other one is who remains in him and keep on sinning if you don't abide in Christ. So basically, if you become a believer and you keep on sinning, basically, you keep doing that same sin of lust and fornication or adultery or stuff like that, you know, uh, uh, sooner or later, God's going to say, you know, I gave you enough time here to get this together. You know, I can take my rod only so far with you and kind of nudge you here and nudge you there and try to keep you from it. But if you're just going to keep doing this here, you know, what, what what's salvation going to do for you? Because God can't commit, God can't condone sin. God's not going to have it in heaven. It's up to us to make that choice. He gives us free will to make that choice to sin or not to sin. So we must turn from sin and repent from it. That's what we mean. Okay. So we got the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost and not abiding in Christ, basically. Our two sins that are unforgivable in God's eye. So you can be blotted out in the book of life. But if you do accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, and you do abide in Him, and do your best to live a godly life, you know, you 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 can pretty much guarantee you're going to escape the white throne judgment and not be judged against your deeds, and that you will have eternal salvation, that you will be in the book of life. Okay, so grace. I've explained it in short and stuff. Uh, basically, it's tomorrow's sin already forgiven. Uh, it's just something that fills me up every day knowing that I have that. Uh, I know that my sin that I did before I knew Jesus was taken away. I know my sin that I did while I was trying to learn about Jesus and be have a personal relationship with him has... Uh, been took it away and any sin that i will probably commit in my future which i try not to i try to turn my life into more of a godly lifestyle and turn away from things that i used to do you know uh, heaven is the destination i want to be at one day it's home like paul said these tents are temporary uh so this is it, say if you read the bible nine out of nine people are going to die Okay, we all are going to go to heaven one day. We all are going to be up there one day. It's just a matter of how you want to get up there and stay up there or get up there and uh, go take a swim in the lake of fire. Yeah, that's the second death. I don't think I want to be in that part. You know, I, I already had visions of it and it's not a good thing. It's not, it's not, it's not meant for he, he, uh, us humans at all. Hell was meant for the devil and his principalities that committed sin against God. That's what hell was designed for. God does not want us to go there. He uh, He wants us to turn from it and accept him. So if you haven't accepted Jesus Christ, go ahead and do so. Admit you're a sinner. Ask for Jesus to come to your heart. And find a good Bible-based church to go to. Uh it's kind of my message here. So when we wrap up the discussion, it's my hope and prayer you have a better understanding about salvation, the Lamb's Book of Life, and grace. I know in my early experiences going to church on Sunday as a kid, as a young adult, we would only get snippets about grace and salvation from preachers and taught one denominational way to worship. For some, the message of the Bible can be clouded at times, this is the message that the enemy does not want you to hear. So what is the enemy next for the enemy to do? Well, it's to cloud the issue and make you not see God's grace. But you got to be smarter than the enemy. you got to put on your armor. Uh, it's in Corinthians what the armor is. Uh, I'm running out of time here, so I will let you go. You guys have a good day.